thank the family, Noble and Payne family, for allowing us to present their story and uh, have a conversation about these dynamic gentlemen and legendary journalists. I'd like to also thank uh, Vince Mutro, the president. Um, some of us saw, spoke with um, Vanessa about that. She was the chairman of the Black Studies Department. She's responsible for us having this place. Um, this is the third lasting legacies type of event that we've had here. We've had two before, thanks to uh, Karen Witherspoon and Roscoe Brown. Roscoe Brown was the one that pretty much instructed me to work with City College. Uh, just for those of you who don't know about the Harlem Cultural Archives, about 11 years ago, Ken Sargent, my brother, and I decided to create a historical society that was totally devoted to memorializing and making accessible um, information about Harlem um, iconics, individuals, and institutions. Uh, these two gentlemen obviously fall within that category, and to make it easily accessible as well. So um, when Roscoe said, okay, Glenn, you go to City College, talk to this person, I said, yes, Dr. Brown, yes, Dr. Brown. <laughs> um, not that I don't know this place, I, I earned a bachelor's and two master's degrees here, so I kind of like this place. And I think it's a fantastic uh, school. It's one of the top schools in the country for social mobility. So, um, before I get started, I'd like to express regrets to the family and the audience from um, Charlie Rangel and uh, Dave Dinkins and David. Ms. Dave, Mayor Dinkins sent something I'd like to read to you. Our lifetime Mayor David Dinkins sent sincere and early regrets that an immovable conflict would prevent him from joining this tribute for his dear friends tonight. Were he able to speak with us tonight, he would likely address all of the dignitaries and celebrities in the room by saying something like this, and I quote, given the number of very important people assembled here today and the press of time, I am tempted to resort to the practice I learned from Af African diplomats of simply saying the usual protocols observed. <laughs> um, right after this, I'd like to, we're going to show a couple of uh, clips of, of Gil and Les, and uh, again, this can no way encapsulate all the uh, great things they've done, but I think the conversations with the panelists will give us some information. I'm here to learn something, too, as well. So, Herb Boyd, by the way, who sends his regrets, um, he asked me to say a few things. He said, uh, with regard to Gil Noble, and I quote, the show was a staple of information on the global black community. Another quote, and he mentioned, the role he played in supplying our community with the best in journalism, the best platform for revolutionary voices. And that's a quote from my Herb boy. With regard to Les, and I quote, Les Payne was the consummate journalist, a reporter, and editor of unimpeachable integrity. And he would regale you with story after story of the people he knew and covered during his remarkable career. And another quote he had about Les was that objectivity was one of his calling cards. Okay, so thank you again for coming. I'd like to uh, just get started with a, a brief clip for some of the folks who don't know about Gil and Les, and after that we'll get started with the panel. Thank you very much. I got myself a job, and uh, in two years, a year after Malcolm was struck down at uh, WLIB in Harlem, and then two years later. I was hired by Channel 7, not because of my skills, but because of the political pressure of the time, because there were no people of color who were reporting, and the top story was us. And so these white reporters would be coming to Harlem, and the community began to say, get out of here. That's right. So I found myself employed. My first week at ABC, my first major assignment was the uh, so-called riots in Newark. That was my baptism of fire and I landed uh, a permanent job and then in 68 when Dr. King was struck down a collective mantle of guilt fell over the United States and a lot of things began to open up and uh, the local stations all decided that they were going to do what they had never done before and have a black program. So channel 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13 all came up with one black pro program and like it is, was it. 
And wouldn't you know it, but I eventually became the producer <laughs> in 1975. And then I had what every journalist fantasizes about, and that is an opportunity to tell his or her own story based on their perspective. And that resonates with me today. I got some email this morning about a program we had on last yesterday. I've and one of the viewers it. said, why don't you tell the other story? You, you know, why don't you, why do you always just s tell one side? This is the other side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? But it's the socialization of this country. And so Like It Is has tried to do that, to tell the other side. This is the antidote. We're on one hour a week. And uh, the 167 hours a week and the rest of the broadcast week is all coming out of a white psyche. And over the the life of the program, we have the largest collection of moving picture images about our story on the planet. Um, it's um, something I'm very proud to have been the doorman to. I think that uh, the baby boomer generation in the media have, have, have itself to blame somewhat. I mean, I think it is generational. I think that nature had pores a vacuum. And I think that there had been a, an increasing vacuum you know, in news deliveries. And I think that uh, news had not only were the anchors and uh, co-anchors expected to go and engage on the entertainment side, but I think entertainment began to infuse news, what passed for news, uh, which is an important information to have some bearing on informing people in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. So I think that there had been uh, kind of uh, cross-pollination of news and entertainment, both in what is presented and in those who present it. And so I think that, uh, and into this increasing vacuum. So, I mean, if, 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 if it's a straight news person who's doing this, why not go to the, the real entertainment and have him mesh his entertainment with news? Right. One of the dangers of the unsophisticated viewer, of course, is, that is distinguishing between uh, what's fun, what's joke, uh, you know, and, and what's news and, and what's serious. Yeah, that's, that's a danger to journalism and therefore that's a danger to the republic and, and as a newspaper man, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound as if I'm, you know, it's all TV. I mean, our own business, our own craft, as it were, has been uh, roughly in the same way. And basically, I think the, 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 the it's greed. Right. So it's, it's greed. That's the bottom line. It's greed. I mean, and, 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 and I think without going to the long glory history, uh, the newspapers were highly profitable when they were in private hands. Corporations looked at them and began in the 70s, they began to buy them up. Right. So they could make money. I was on a Bill show. Yes, Joe and New York all like it is. And the big question was, what is the journalist's responsibility to the black community? And my view then, now and always, was that uh, our responsibility, the, the journalist's responsibility to the black community is to tell them the truth. That truth should be verified. That truth, truth should be relevant. The truth should fit within the, uh, the, the context of propriety. Uh, and, and then and you should tell the truth that that is our responsibility. And I make the point that we do not have the responsibility to black leaders. We don't have any responsibility to leaders. Our, our responsibility is to the community, to black people, to give them the information so that they can make up their minds about what they are going to think about black leaders or white leaders or who they're going to vote for or which car they should buy. And our responsibility as black journalists is not to protect any young men or any black leader. That our responsibility is to tell the truth. And if the truth does not protect them, those black leaders, I don't care if it's Farrakhan or King or anyone else, should stand naked before their people. That was my point. So like I said, this is just a quick snapshot of where these guys are coming from. And thank God we had them around. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator, um, Gary Pierre Pierre. Sunday at noon. Oh, 
It's the Almani. What? And it's 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 it's, it's really a, an honor for me to be here as we've met uh, Gil and Lester's family. Uh, we are just going to get right into it. I want you to introduce yourself so you can start Tommy. So thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I want to thank City College, Glenn Hunter, and the Harlem Archives for organizing this program and to the tribute of uh, these two great men um, who we love and hold in our hearts and memories. Um, I am the oldest daughter of Les Payne, <laughs> the oldest child. She and never, never <laughs> missed that. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I don't want to make this about me at all, but um, I will say that in uh, working mainly with my dad for the last couple of years and finishing his book on Malcolm X, yeah. and um, you know, so for the last 28 years, you know, he's been doing a research. And that's been a couple. <laughs> yeah, he's been doing research, and um, and I've been working with him since day one. So um, I. Just want to say that's who I am. I've been working with them. Uh, I will announce that the book will be published in one year. The title of the book is The Dead Are Arising. And uh, we look forward to filling you in with the details of that as they rise. Uh, good afternoon, family. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'd like to first uh, send out condolences to the Elijah Cummings family, uh, which was a shocking loss today, uh, to a great man, uh, a civil rights icon, a warrior, and someone who's on the front line fighting for all of us his entire life. I always like to start off by thanking the ancestors who fought, died, and bled for all of us. For without them, we are nothing. Uh, so it's always important to recognize how many people sacrifice so much, including my father and Les Payne. Um, I am his son, my name is Chris Noble. Uh, extremely proud to, uh, to be his son and to be here uh, for this event. Um, and I look forward to getting into uh, a discussion uh, about all the elements of what my father's career was about. But, and there's so much. So it's an honor to be here with the Payne family. It's an honor to be here at City College. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and of course, it's an honor to be with Milton Alamadi, who is my hero. Um, uh, this, um, I'm, I'm Jamal Payne. I'm a Les Payne's son. Uh, Tamara's brother. Um, <laughs> no, brother, we'll just keep it like that. <laughs> she, she can say what she wants, but, um, I, and I would like to, you know, again, you know, obviously acknowledge the, uh, the ancestors because I think that one of the things that we have to uh, pay attention to is the shoulders on which we stand and that we did not get here. It didn't start when we came here. We're part of a continuum and we are passing the baton when we leave here. And so we need to understand that while we're here, we have a job to do, but there was there were people that were here that did a job before we got here. And um, when you look at two men like uh, Gil Noble and my father, Les Payne, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, I won't speak for Chris, but to be the son of Les Payne, it's, uh, those are some tremendous shoes to have to fill. And, uh, you know, and a lot of people ask the question, well, what are you gonna do? And I mean, like, you know, there's a lot that has to be done, but I mean, I think that um, we should always look at, uh, I mean, the perspective that I have now is that um, I don't look at other people and say, what are they going to do? Because now I have to answer that question for myself. Well, what am I going to do in, these, in this shadow that I stand in? But I mean, we all stand in the shadow. So it's not, it's not only on me. It's not only on Chris. It's not only on Tamara and, and Milton. It's on all of us. We all stand in the shadow of what the work that these people did because they showed us. And so once it has been shown, it is known. And once it is known, then we have to act. And so we can't wait for somebody to come to do something, we have to decide what are we gonna do? And uh, you know, that I believe is the message from my father is what are we going to do? You know, we're gonna figure out, we're gonna get all of our skills together and we're gonna do something. And I mean, I think that if you're gonna talk about what 
uh, both Gil and Les did, that's what they did. They did something. And we have, you know, you know tremendous amounts of uh, work that still exists from what they did. And, uh, you know, I'm, and, and I'm excited to discuss that tonight. And, uh, you know, you know let's, get, <laughs> let's get to it. Great. Greetings, sisters and brothers. Uh, I feel honored to be here today, to be a part of this panel discussion. I feel blessed and honored to have known both Les, um, Gil Noble. In fact, I'm choking up a bit, so I won't speak too long. I consider them dear friends. And when I calm down a little, I promise you I'll be able to share some of the memories. Thank I'm you. Sure, I'm sure you will. Uh, let's get started with you, Tammy. Um, I, I knew your father, and he seemed to be a pretty, very intense person. Uh, tell us uh, another side of him that you remember. <laughs> um, no, well, Dad loved everybody. He dealt with people where they were, and that's a special talent. Um, and he, he, was in a, he had an enormous curiosity. And he was always, when he spoke to people, he was very curious about what a person, where they are in their life. And it didn't matter what they did. It didn't matter where they came from. It didn't matter what race they were. Um, he had an enormous curiosity and interest in just who we are as living organism, organisms and beings. And, you know, and, and what he brought it to himself with, you know, with his passion as far as what everybody knows him for as, as a race man, for, for example, um, that was really born out of the whole circumstance of what this country has, was built on. But that does not negate us from getting to know each other and crossing these, um, crossing the line. So one of the, my takeaways from that always was just, and, and we love to talk about um, just where, who people are and what they were about. Um, and just interesting tidbits, whether it's their personality quirks, what made them stronger, what made them um, an asset, how to work with the deficiencies, and not to leave anybody behind. The other thing that Dad really stressed with me and my brothers is that we don't, we don't believe in uh, you know, this elitism. We don't, you know, we, it's, it's, in fact, I'm very uncomfortable around people who have elitist views. And, um, and there are a lot of them. <laughs> but I usually like to take my energy to knock them down off of that. And, um, but, you know, dad and my mom, they were, you know, we didn't, we didn't have that. So, and they worked hard with us on that. You want to add anything, uh, Um Just listening to my sister speak, I, it just brings this uh, conversation that uh, a colleague of my dad who was an African-American journalist, asked my dad in front of me if my dad and my mom had the talk with us. You know, sat my brother and I down and said, you know, hey, you're a black man in this country and whatever. And so my dad, you know, he didn't even think about it. He was like, no, I didn't have that conversation because, you know, uh, you know we didn't, we didn't discuss that. And, you know, this guy couldn't believe it. He said, Jamal, your father never had to talk with you? And I'm like, you're asking me this? He's standing right there. And like, you want me to contradict him right in his face? And, he, and I said, no, he didn't. And then I thought about it. And my dad and I talked about it, and you know, and my parents taught us to be respectful of people, to be respectful of all people, and to especially be respectful of elders. And so if you teach children that, right, to be respectful in situations and circumstances, you don't have to necessarily have the talk. And they did not have the talk, and that's not to say that I did not have encounters with the police because I'm a black man in America. And it's not to say that there weren't situations that could have turned a lot worse than they actually were, but the but in our situation, and I can speak to this, he was a person that believed in fairness and justice, and he did not imbue us with a sense of you are different, and therefore you have to go out and change the world. He was like, you are who you are, and you're going to encounter the world, and he, he, he infused us with an ability to interact with the world, so he did not imbue us with a feeling that we have to act any different. We will be respectful in all situations. And I find sometimes when I speak to younger people now, they say, respect is earned and you have to earn my respect. And I'm like, no, 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 young one. I have lived more years. I, you have to respect the years that I've lived first. 
And I mean, and now that doesn't mean you have to accept or agree or like what I do, but by my years alone, you should have the respect. And I mean, I think that when you start from that position, as opposed to, you know, I mean, and, and you know, and I don't want to go off into all those things, but I mean, I just, I, you know, I mean, and, and I, it just sat with me that this guy couldn't believe that, you know, my dad, because of who he was, I mean, what he said and the things that he did, but I mean, he never taught us that. He didn't teach us that we, well, you have to work 10, he didn't teach us that we have to work 10 times harder to be, you know, but he, he, you know, when we would sit there and not get the accolades that we thought we would do, that we had to have that conversation of, well, you still, you know, he would, he would discuss, and I talked to some of my uh, employees that, I'm a manager at Major League Baseball, and I talk to some of my employees, and I talk about integrity. And that's what he would teach us, is it's about integrity. That's why you work hard. You don't work hard so that someone will do something. You work hard for your integrity. That's what it is. Integrity and character is about what you do when no one else is looking. That's what it is, and I mean, and that's what it's about. You don't do it so that someone will recognize you. Because if their recognition is what you seek, then they can control your actions, right? Your, what your actions should be based on your integrity. And I mean, now we can have the conversation about do they recognize it and do they, uh, you know, nominate you and do they do those things. We can have that conversation, but your drive should not be about what someone else is talking about. It should be about you internally, because when it's internal, you can control everything. When you are in control, you, when, when it's about you, you are in control. But if it's someone else that didn't give you a job or someone else didn't recognize you, then you don't have any responsibility. You can, you know what I mean? And, and we get into the self-responsibility and all that. But I, I, I mean, that's, that's the thing that I can think about about my dad. And, you know, sorry, I, I tend to go on a little bit. Well, this is why we're here tonight. <laughs> Please, sir. I, I'll just apologize in advance. Okay. <laughs> Chris, same question. Well... I had many talks with my father, <laughs> um, and um, I can't even tell you how many conversations we had. My father, one of the most valuable uh, things my father taught me was to be proud of my Africanness. Um, and he taught me about my African history and how important it was. And he built a, a foundation by doing that. Um, you know, information is, is so important. Um, you know, I remember listening to, I was going back the other day, I was listening to an old program uh, that he did with um, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema and Dr. Ben. And Dr. Ben was saying that when he, you know, he grew up in Puerto Rico and um, where else, the Virgin Islands? Um, and coming through that process, he said he was a perfect fool until he was in his mid-twenties. Um, and Dr. Ivan Van Sertema said the same thing. So the system is designed to keep information away from us so we don't wake up. Uh, so my father was wake awakened by what was going on in Harlem by studying uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And um, I'll tell you a little story, because it's very important how people are shaped, how their thinking is shaped, and how that affects the rest of their life. Very early on, uh, Muhammad Ali had just won the championship. My father was working at uh, WLIB in Harlem. And Bill McQuarrie was the news director at the time. Shout out to Bill McQuarrie because he gave my father his first job. Um, and he sent my father over. Ali was in Harlem at a restaurant. And he sent my father to the restaurant to cover the story. And my father got there, and there was a sea of white reporters. And here my father is, just this lonely black face at the back of the crowd. He wasn't well known at the time. So Ali comes out, and he you know, looks around and he points to my father and he says like this, come in. And the whole crowd has to open up to let my father come through and these white reporters are looking at my father like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> and you know, my father got into the restaurant he said, Mr. Ali, thank you so much for giving, this giving me this opportunity, I really appreciate it. And Ali looked at him and said, don't worry about it, brother. Just make sure you pass on the favor. 
And my father was so blown away by that. Here's a man in his early 20s with the world in the palm of his hand, and his mindset was my people first. And it was experiences like that that shaped my father's thinking. And he modeled his career based on those type of uh, thoughts. I mean, it was always about doing what he had to do to educate us as a people. And everything that he was doing was for us. Like it is was for us. He never considered like it is his show. It was the people's show. And like it is was the doorway to information. So uh, my father used to sit me down. I used to feel like I was on like it is sometimes. <laughs> so he would sit me down and just school me. But I'm so happy he did that. And you know, it's funny, you know, when you get that information about yourself and where you come from, mm -hmm. it's not that you're not going to make mistakes in life. But it, what it does is it gives you a strong foundation so no, no matter what you do, you're going to be standing strong. So that's what he gave me, and that, that, that's extremely valuable. And um, I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Chris. So Milton, uh, same question to you. Uh, what do you remember most about Gil and Les's legacy that you know, most of us don't know about? Well, I think we all know the fact that they're brilliant journalists. And you know, in this country, sometimes it's measured by the awards. But I don't think they really cared about that. The awards came because they were performing excellent reporting and excellent journalism. And to me, I like how they elevated the centrality of Africa in their journalism. And they found out that there is a big audience for that. There's a big appetite for that. And I'm reminded of, uh, and also, you know, your father told me about Malcolm X and that he grew up at a time when, yes, people would agree with what Malcolm was saying, but they were not used to hearing a black man putting it out so plainly and explicitly. So he said it was almost like hiding behind a door, but wanting to hear what Malcolm was saying. So he took courage, but once he crossed that line, there was no stopping in his hunger to want to find out much more about Africa, African history, African culture, and the same thing with Les as well. And that was reflected in their journalism. And it also reminds me actually of this short speech which Marco made, and he said, you can't hate the roots of a tree without hating the tree. It's short, but it's phenomenal. And he said, one of the main reasons why the nation grew and became huge was its emphasis on African culture, African history, African spirituality. And they found out that it really resonated to people that didn't even think they would embrace it. And then obviously in terms of the journalism, they brought leaders who ordinarily would not be interviewed, leaders of the liberation struggle in African countries, when many African countries were still ruled by white minority regimes, including South Africa, what was then Rhodesia, Angola, uh, uh, Mozambique, now Zimbabwe, of course. Um, they got to speak on like it is. They got interviewed by, by, by Les, and he wrote in his column. In fact, I started reading Newsday simply because of <laughs> you know, Les's column, I have to admit. But the other thing that people don't know about them, I guess, is how humble they really were. So humble, it's unbelievable. These were superstars, but not celebrities, because they didn't buy into that. They thought they had a higher calling, which was to report in form. And I like some of the um, videos that we saw when Les said, it's not our duty to protect black leaders. That's not our duty. Because 
you know, let's be frank, some of our worst enemies happen to be <laughs> black leaders. So I like the honesty that both men also had. They were really sincere in terms of giving back. I've been uh, conducting a workshop called Guerrilla Journalism for the last eight years. Every week for about an hour or two, I give free instruction to ordinary people that just want to learn the basic skills of reporting and writing. And both of them came to my workshop several times to share their experience, share their skills. And in case of, uh, of Gil Noble, he actually invited the entire workshop to the WABC studios to show us around and then to make uh, the presentation. And I don't know how many people know how great of an artist that Gil Noble was. <laughs> I didn't know myself until I visited his office for the first time. I visited several times. And I saw these amazingly beautiful sculptures around the office. And I said, where did you buy these from? And he said, I made them. I said, this is unbelievable. They're phenomenal. They could be shown in exhibitions. And I don't even know how many people know that he had those skills. So I think their humility was what I found most impressive. And obviously their skills. And I learned a lot from their skills as well. And I share their skills in the workshop as well. Uh, can you introduce yourself to the audience since we didn't get a chance to do that? Um, and just go ahead and tell the audience. you. Oh, um, uh, my name is Milton Alimadi. I publish Black Star News. Uh, it's uh, a publication that I consider to be pan-African, Afrocentric, but we really write about everything because I agree with uh, you know, your father that we can't say there's black news, there's non-black news. No. And I, I embrace that from them as well. Uh, and I also teach African history at John Jay College. I've been in journalism for like 20 plus years because I've known you for 20 plus years. <laughs> uh, that's why. Well, thank you. So Tammy, let's get back to you on this because uh, your dad, like I said, was a very uh, conscientious person. I'm not revealing anything anybody doesn't know, but. If he were alive today, what do you think he would tell aspiring journalists and historians? Uh, uh, what, what advice would he give them? Do the work. <laughs> do the work. No shortcuts. Um, it's not easy. Um, and go where the facts lead you. Um, you may set out on a story and you have an idea of what the story is. But the facts are saying, no, it's not what happened. You know, it happened this way, or this person got it wrong, or the, t the date doesn't jive. And you have to go with that. And um, you can't fudge it. You, you shouldn't. Because the passion that I found with both Gil and my father was that um, they wanted to use their platforms to inform our people, to make to make intelligent decisions. And you can't do that if you're not informed. And if you're not given the information, which at the time, we're talking about 70s, 80s, and certainly in the 90s, and even today, where it's a totally different model, but with us talk about when they were in their highlight, in the um, strength of their career, um, the media was, we were not the mainstream stories. We were not the mainstream. They, were fully under, they fully were aware and understood that they did not represent that, and they were fine with that. And, um, but they wanted to make sure that we were covered because we are members of the, of the society. Um, I remember you know, one of the things, when Dad was inducted into the Long Island, which to me was funny, uh, <laughs> the Long Island Journalism Hall of Fame, because <laughs> the letters that Dad got from Long Island was about his columns. They hated him, you would think. <laughs> so when I heard that he was getting to the Hall of Fame, I was like, stop. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But um, one of the uh, people who worked at Newsday was then teaching uh, journalism. He said to me, you know, I used this slide in my 
in my uh, classes and I teach them and it's the same your dad used to say. You know, he said, we all talk about the weather and it snows in Centerport, it snows in Northport, these are very white <laughs> cities and, and towns in Long Island. He says, it snows in my backyard too in South Huntington. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's like you have to do the work and, and inform people, and inform people that other people exist. That's, these are the communities. And it's not just for black people, it's that they have to know that we exist, and they have to know what our concerns are, because our concerns are their concerns. When there's high crime rate, that affects everybody. You know, not just one population. So today, yeah, dad would do the work. And he would be critical, very critical, of what's going on in journalism today. Because it is not journalism, it's not. Uh, I think my father would say, study your history, you know, study African history. I remember he told me, uh, how many people in here know who Jackie McLean was? It's a brilliant... <laughs> well, Jackie and my father were running buddies right here in Harlem, not, not a couple blocks away. And um, Jackie started, you know, a, uh, a music school up in Connecticut before he passed away. He was a brilliant musician. And all of these musicians were clamoring to study under Jackie McLean. They were, they were so excited. And they got up there, and the first day in class, he told his students, we're not getting to the music until you study African history. Imagine that. You're there to pursue a music career, and this man is telling you, you're not gonna get to music until you study African history. So, Jackie and my father used to feed off each other, and Jackie got a lot from my father, and my father got a lot from Jackie, but it was that mindset of knowing your history, because you have to have that foundation, so you'll know what to do when you get in positions to disseminate information or whatever you end up doing in your life, your mindset is the key. And unfortunately today, um, this is everybody's mind today, okay? We, we live in a land full of robots where people are walking around like this. And 24 seven, almost walking into trains. And it's very controlled information, and it's 24-7. And they find out whatever it is you like, and they feed it to you all the time. And, you know, it's, it's amazing because, um, you know, they've really figured out how to really, you know, put this thing together. I mean, you know, first they create what's in our appetite, and then they feed it to you 24-7. And then they take away all the programs on TV that would offset that type of thinking. There's no more Positively Black, there's no Tony Brown Journal, there's no Like It Is, there's no Macquarie Report. All of that is wiped away. And it's straight garbage. You get reality television. How many of you have seen Love and Hip Hop? It's a, it's, this is what these kids are looking at. This is how they're shaping their thinking. And it's having a tremendous impact on what we get nowadays. And so um, we're in a crisis mode right now because they have figured out how to control our thinking. And there's no shows like, like it is. There's not, I don't know of any news editors for, for newspapers that like your father that are putting out the truth. And so that's why what my father did and what Les Payne did was so important, which was getting out the truth. And I, and I have to say this, the courage, the courage that it took. My father put his life and his job on the line countless times with no fear. I used to tell my father, I said, Dad, are you sure you want to do this story? And he said, son, I'm not going to punk out. That was his words. Just imagine a, a, think a story that you could do could prevent you from feeding your family. And that never entered my father's mind. It didn't sway him. 
it was straight ahead, focused on what he knew he had to do, and it was no, it was no deviating from that. It's, it's an amazing thing to watch as a young man, the courage of these two men to do what they did, so, you know. I don't know how I follow that, but I mean, because I mean, I absolutely agree. And uh, my father, like uh, Gil, he was, uh, you know, fearless. You know, I mean, he was chased out of six countries, three at gunpoint. Um, and he would always talk about that. And uh, I remember um, one thing that he confided in me is that when he was living this life and going in journalism and covering these stories, he never stopped to think about what he was doing. He just was on to the next story. And so, when he retired from Newsday in uh, 06 and he stopped writing his column in 08, he started having a little bit more time to think about his career and you know, so then I would sit with him. So for the last decade of his life, I was able to just sit with him and just, I just sat there and just listened to him and he would talk about his career. And so the story that kept coming up from him was South Africa. He covered South Africa and the Soweto uprising and just how he did it. And I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing story. And, and I mean, and I just was like, dad, we, we have to, we have to get this down. We have to, we have to put it out. And he was like, oh, Jamal, it was already in the newspaper. You know, people could go find it. I said, Dad, these kids are not going to go see microfiche. You know I mean? I was, that was in 70. You know, and they're not going to go see microfiche. And I don't even know if they're digitizing that stuff. But I was like, you know, people need to see these stories. But he, he just kept telling me about this place, South Africa and, and Johannesburg and Cape Town. I heard these names. And then I read the series. And I'm like, OK. But I still had I'd never been there. I never saw it. And, you know, I, I just couldn't put it together. And then I, you know, in 2011, I just, unbeknownst to him, I decided I was going to go by myself. I was going to go to South Africa to see this place that he, you know, did all these things. And uh, I was very young when he did this. And, uh, you know, he left for, you know, many, many months. And I'm sure my mother can speak to how many months that, that, that it was because he knows exactly how many it was. And I mean, and, and it was just the tremendous partnership that they had that he felt that he could go do these things. But uh, when I went to see what South Africa actually was, when I I'll never forget the first day when I went to Soweto. And I mean, I went to Soweto in 2011. When I first went to Soweto, and I saw what it was like. It looked like Brooklyn. It was like, you know, Brooklyn, two million people. And, but there's one road in and one road out. My dad told me, you know, when I was there, yeah, tomorrow I, I rented a car. And I just drove in, 1976. I just drove into Soweto, and I said, well, you know, and it didn't make any sense. And I go to the apartheid museum, and then they're like, they had these huge military vehicles that blocked the roads. And so, like, if he had gotten caught, that's it. That's, that's it. He, and I mean, he just went. And I said, Dad, I, I came home and had a lot of questions. I had a lot of questions for him. I said, Dad, you drove into Soweto? He said, yeah, you know, I look just like any other African. He said, I just drove, you know, because I was telling a cab driver, we're going from the airport uh, in Johannesburg, and I was telling the cab driver, hey, my dad, was, you know, was an American journalist, and he covered the Soweto uprising. And so, the, you know, African, he looked at me, and he said, mm-hmm. And I said, and, you know, he would go into Soweto. And, I mean, this guy almost pulled over off the highway looked at me and said, no, no. Your father could not go to Soweto in 1976. He barely go there now. And I was like, no, no, no. And I said, no, 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 no. My father doesn't look like me. My father's much darker. And he, I said, he doesn't look like because he said, you are colored. He said, oh, no, they have never. He said, you, you, Alexandria is another township. And he was like, you would never be able to get into Soweto. And I said, oh, no, no, no. My dad didn't look like me. He was much darker. And he said, oh. And he, then he kept driving. And then, you know, and I, but I mean, it, it made me understand, like, okay, what's really going on? But when I realized the, the danger that was involved, and my dad was saying, Jamal, there were children and people massacred. And the, 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 official, uh, the official number, I believe it was 100 or 200. And there were many more. It was multiplied by three or four times that. And my dad, and in that story and in so many others, he said, these are not mosquitoes. These are people, and they have families, and their families deserve to know what happened to them. And he was like, and it is, it is my job as a journalist to go find out what happened. And he did that when there was an explosion in Bhopal. He did it so many times in his career. He was about, as an editor and as a journalist, he was about finding out the information. And so as my sister said, he was about doing the work. And that doesn't mean sitting at the police station and you know t dictating notes that the police give you. It means going out into the field. Uh, Dwayne Wickham, who is a very good friend of my dad's and who was a columnist for USA Today for a long time, told me a story. And he said that your father told me that if there are more than three journalists in a location, there's no story there. 
<laughs> and I said, what? And he was like, no, he was like, if they're all congregating in the same area, he's like, you need to go somewhere else because you got to go find the story. And so like, that is what he was about. I mean, like, and you know, and, 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 and he was absolutely about finding out, you know, the, 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 the issues of, 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 of our day. And, and just, I, I know I went on a tangent there, but the point that I really wanted to make, and a lot of people don't really understand this, is my dad was a, he believed in Jeffersonian First Amendment journalism. He believed in the right to the free press. He absolutely believed in it. I remember one time in the 90s, I called my dad and I was furious. I was emotional. Bill Rowley had said something on TV and I was just like, Dad, we got to do something about this guy. Like, he has said something and we got to take him off the air. And I told him what I said. And my dad listened to me and he said, huh. And he was like, yeah, that's not great. You know, it sounds horrible. And I said, we got to, you know, we got to mobilize, you know, because I, you know, watched all of the activists and I'm like, this is what we do. And my dad was like, well, I'm not an activist. I'm an advocate. And I'm a journalist. And he said, I, I don't believe. He said, Jamal, I believe in the first man. I don't believe in censorship in any form. I was like, what? And he said, no. He said, but what happens is I have a column and I'm a journalist. And he said, so if Bill O'Reilly says something or if some story happens, he was like, well, I have a mechanism that I can use, and he would say this. He used his column as a bludgeoning weapon to bludgeon the, 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 uh, the afflicted, you know, the, the, the perpetrators against the afflicted. And he used his column and his journalism as that to answer those questions. And so I remember, you know, he did, in that case, he just said, you know, we have to uh, address it. And I mean, and it did go away, and Bill O'Reilly caught flack, but Bill O'Reilly did come out and say something about a, a fellow journalist whose name is Randall Pinkston. And, you know, and my dad wrote a letter and he, I mean, he went after him. And Bill Riley had the apology. He had to come out and apologize. And, and my dad, what he taught me was, is that you don't, he wouldn't believe in cancel culture. My dad doesn't believe in that. He would, he would say, you do have to challenge these people because we are talking about institutional systems. And what they want to do is take an individual and then remove them. And then we all get upset about that individual. Like if there's anyone in this room that believes that Trump is the creator of what we're looking at, I mean, you are delusional. This has existed for 400 years in this country and for many more in the world. Trump is simply a symptom. He is the blurry vision to cataracts to, uh, of, of America's racism. He does not, he has no, there's no, he, he, is, he, he has no uh, 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 power or whatever. He doesn't even know what he's doing, but he is a symptom. He is not the, he is not the, 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 the beginning of this. And I mean, you know, and so, and, 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 and so I, I said all that to say that he, he would be about, he would not be about cancel culture. He would definitely speak about that because, I mean, there, you know, there are people who should be held accountable for their words. The freedom of speech does not protect you from accountability, but you shouldn't have to go away forever and, you know, and, and we throw away the key. I mean, like, you should be able to come back. And I mean, I think that that is what we have to have because if we don't understand that, they're going to come for us too. And so and that's what you see is that, yeah, we got the Confederate monuments down, but now they're coming after our monuments. Now they're coming out, you know, so you don't win and, you know, and then say, oh, this is great. You're like, they're going to come for you. So you have to understand that one action begets another action. And, you know, and so we have to be very, you know, conscious of what it is that we're doing. And then, you know, and then take on the, the issues, at, you know, head on. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Milton? Your thoughts on what uh, uh, Les and Gil will right. tell aspiring journalists? And, uh, <laughs> I'll go. Let's start with Les. Les actually understood the confusion that's now been opened up with uh, social media being the go-to platform. But at the same time, he actually believed we should find a way to embrace it and make it work to our advantage. He, I don't think, like any one of us, has thought out how we should do it and can do it, but he sees tremendous possibilities in the sense that it's going to be much more difficult now, even though just a handful of corporations, yes, own 90% of the main, so-called mainstream media. He says, on the other hand, the only way to break that stranglehold is for us to embrace social media, but find a way to disseminate the information that could be both entertaining but empowering at the same time. And I am actually encouraged by that because in my 
history class at John Jay, the first day of class, I ask every student, one by one, and there are about 30 students in each class, I teach three classes. When you hear Africa, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? So it's normally like a disease, safari, gold, diamond, slavery, <coughs> tribal war. That's the beginning of the semester. But then when you teach them about the Berlin Conference, how Europeans went and methodically split up the continent, turned it into plantations, extracted cheap labor, plundered resources, and continue to do it today in the 21st century, and you explain that to them, and you explain how there was, in fact, African resistance. When you explain to them that Ethiopia was never colonized because Menelik and the Empress, Betul, defeated an Italian army commanded by five generals. They say, why didn't we learn this in high school? So by the end of the semester, they have a yearning to learn more about the African condition today and how resources are still being exploited. They want that they stay after class, to want to learn more. And these are people who, in the beginning, so at the end of the semester, I ask them again, okay, so now when you hear Africa, what comes to your mind? Patrice Lumumba, Thomas Sankara, Nelson Mandela, Africans who've always tried to change this condition. They have a different look toward Africa. And that's what uh, your father's show did very effectively. I, let me just, a few anecdotes about your father. People told me that they always had a dilemma because Sunday is a church day. So what should I do? Should I go to church? A watch like it is. <laughs> How much reverence did people have for your father? And this is something that actually I also shared when the New York Times wrote the story after he passed away. I remember one day when I was entering a bus and I was about to sl slip my Metro card, the driver put his hand and blocked it. And I looked at him, I said, what's wrong? He said, anybody who's on like it is does not pay on my bus. <laughs> I, I don't know how the MTA would feel about it. <laughs> I was on a subway train, and there are several seats around, and this young lady comes over and says, excuse me, can I sit next to you? This is New York, and you know, <laughs> you know. So I wasn't sure, I said, I was looking at other empty seats, and I looked at her, and I think she could see my question was why, without asking it. She said, I saw you on Like It Is. And she wanted to sit next to me because she saw me on Like It Is. Our people respect quality information and journalism. And the other thing I respected a lot about Les, in both of their cases, the courage, the courage to be in an audience, African Americans, and stick to a position they believe, even if they know it's not popular. So remember when Guerrilla Journalism, we do an annual awards thing, and he was the guest speaker that particular year. And he spoke about the Tawana Brawley case, which is of course a very emotional issue. And he said he did a lot of reporting, and he came to the conclusion that this was not a true story the way it was presented. And he was booed. This is the guest of honor <laughs> who had been given an award speaking, being booed. And he waited it out. He said, well, okay, I'll wait till the boo is over. And then he's tried again, he was booed again. But at some point, they allowed him to speak. And he explained methodically how he did the journalism and came to that conclusion. Now, I'm not saying they embraced him after that, but there was some respect, and I respected him. I really respect him a lot more after he stood up to that. He didn't even have to bring out that issue. So, in the case of Les, I think he would say, let's continue embracing this new platform. None of us had the solution yet how to do it, make it more effective. In the case of Gil Noble, I think he would be bitterly disappointed that there's nothing close to like it is today. And we know the power 
of broadcast journalism. So that's something that we still need to find a way how to get something of the caliber of like it is back on the platform. Thank you, Milton. And uh, now we'd like to, uh, first, before we start with uh, questions, ladies and gentlemen, and I emphasize the word questions, please give a round of applause to this panel and these moderators. Just one more thing before I go ahead. I'd like a dear friend of mine who is master of the spoken word. Um, I can go on and on. Felipe Luciano, will you please stand up? I learned a lot from him as well. Come on down so we can get you. It was 1969. Um, a group of black Puerto Ricans decided that we didn't want to be represented um, as Desi Arnazes anymore. <laughs> and right. we put together a group called the Young Lords. Yes. Um, we were probably pound for pound the best fighting unit in this country. Bobby Seale and I talk about this all the time. Um, I didn't, we bought the guns, we did not want to bring them out. In those days, they had something called a Sullivan Law violation. You can get a year for each gun. So we decided to hold them until we had to do it. In those days, there was a tremendous synergy between blacks and Puerto Ricans. It had been going on for 100 years in this, in this city. I don't know how many of you know this, but there were a bunch of Cubans up here, a bunch of Puerto Ricans right up here. Yeah. Um, in fact, Dizzy talks about it. It was, Sonny Rollins was also up here besides Jackie McLean and um, um, Gil Noble, who, by the way, played an excellent piano. Excellent piano. Would have been a jazz man if he had not gone into news. May I just tell you that, number one, and I'll try to make this short. Number one, they represented, Les and Gil represented warriorhood. I know we loved rap, I did. I love Stokely, I love Martin, I love Malcolm, but to be able to every day be fair, impartial, accurate, compassionate um, is an incredible thing. And you're absolutely right, it takes courage. It takes courage. Les had to fight an editor. Newsday was ridiculously conservative. It was stupid. I, how he got that position the only way he got that position is through excellence. Excellence. And that's what he told me. Remember, it was Les Payne who told us in his columns that it was Cuba who liberated South Africa. It left me stunned. It's why Mandela loved Fidel. Cuba, those black soldiers, black and white, but mainly black, were the ones who fought. And he says the shock of South African troops seeing black men firing back, they had already won the war psychologically. Nelson Mandela never forgot it. Gil Noble interviewed me in 1969, I think it was 1970. I was in the Young Lords and he interviewed me when he knew what it was gonna cost him. I mean, we were being followed, Cointel Pro was on us, it was ridiculous. But he, inter he interviewed every radical group there was because he believed that people needed to hear. What are these young people doing? I kept a relationship with him until, well, he passed. It was, and he was like that. His thing was, either you a punk or you ain't. If you a frog leap, if you want to throw down, let's do this. I reject the theory that men, in order to be valid and legitimate, have to be so passive that they can't punch you in the face. I, re I reject that. The black men, the Puerto Rican men, the men I know, the Berrigan boys were like this, always felt that if you want to raise your children right, you must stand for something. And both Les and Gil Noble stood for something. I called Noble the Noble. I called your daddy the Noble. He was like a noble. He was tall, he was handsome. Les Payne would have these piercing eyes. He would look at you and know you were full of shit. <laughs> he, he just wouldn't, he, well, let's, let's talk about this, Felipe. Boom! The last conversation I had with him and Clayton Riley, uh, who's another master journalist, 
They sat in Clayton's house, and I just shut my mouth and listened to them. I got a whole education about education. The word intellect and black somehow don't become synonymous. I don't understand that. What they taught me is that intellect is black. <laughs> you know, that Mali, the African country, gave Europe everything it had. It gave Greece everything it had. That's your daddy. Dr. Ben Cannon. I mean, just so many people. So I thank them for having made me a report. I won two Emmys. I would call uh, Les all the time. I would call um, Gil all the time. The difference between my generation and their generation is I believed, and I don't want to say this, because I think I should say this, because we're at a point now where you're going to have to understand this. I believe in violence. I do not believe in passivity. I do not believe in standing there and taking it and not saying, I'll, I wish you would. The problem is, is that we, we haven't read the Federalist Papers. We don't read. And we don't understand that this Hitlerian stuff is happening again. It happens every 70 years in Western Europe. It's happening again. The guy is telling you to your face, yes, I robbed. I have the G7 summit. It's going to be in my hotel. I'm going to make money. And if you don't like it, go... And the reporters, did you see the mealy mouth reporters that we see on TV now? Yeah. Nobody's saying, man, are you out of your, are you out of your mind? Mm -hmm. Nobody is, see, I believe, and I'll stop this, I believe that the reason for bullies is nobody smacked the hell out of them. In Harlem, you play that game, you keep on bullying, somebody's going to shoot, you end up on the floor. Usually we did it with fists. There is something about us as a people that is so Christian and so compassionate I stay with my mouth up. I can't believe it. Love without justice, and this is what the Ashkenazi Jews that I grew up with told me. Love without justice is not love. There has to be justice. You have to defend. Make a long story short, folks, I would hope that we would read the history of Spain, the history of the African kingdoms of Mali, the history of Israel, and what they did to achieve what they have, Let's not get into where they are now, because I'm, I'm in disagreement with Netanyahu. But they fought very hard for what they have. And it's very difficult to beat a nation that believes if we are going to be free, then we must put our lives on the line. And I'll say this again. These journalists put their lives on the line every day. Every day. I don't know how Les Payne did it, because he was living in Long Island. <laughs> the bastion of white supremacy. How he did it, I do not understand, I still don't. You know, and he never, he said he rarely got into physical fistfights with his editors. Um, <laughs> Gil Noble, I'll end with this. Gil Noble, let me tell you the power of community. The front line of democracy, the front line of democracy is a free press. Without that, we're gonna lose this country. This is an experiment, we're gonna, we're gonna lose it like that. I tell Puerto Ricans all the time, they gave you statehood, they gave you citizenship, they can take it away. They gave us civil rights in 65. They'll take that away if they have to. Get yeah, well. Gil Noble, Gil Noble had, um, did a masterful story on Israel and Palestine. And they threw him out. They stopped the show. Stopped it. They said, that's it. People came from all over. And we protested and protested and protested and told ABC, you can't do that. And he went back on the air. But it takes the community to back these journalists up. It takes the community. Jack Newfield was like that. Jack Newfield was a master. There's a guy in, in, in Chicago called Mike Royko who was like that. There's Pete Hamill who was like that. These are warriors, folks. And so my contention is, and I'll end with this, and I taught at Fordham for a year, and I told my students, journalism, American journalism, I said, if you're going into this field to gain accolades, forget it. If you're going into this field to make some money, definitely forget it. <laughs> but if you're going into this field because you believe that you have something to say, I'm an advocate journalist and I'll be it, but I'm in part, I believe in, uh, what do they call it, subjective objectivity. Know you're black, know who you are, and then tell the truth. Through the lens of a community that sired you. Because some of us get cultural amnesia. So, I love your daddy. Um, I love him because he was a renaissance man. And I loved your daddy. Les Payne was a warrior. And I mean that in every sense of the word. He was as important as Malcolm was, and he was as important as King was, and he was as important as Rap Brown was, who's still in jail, by the way, after 50 years. 
and as important as Stokely Carmichael was. So I say to you, God bless you, thank you, and may they live in our memory for the rest of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sure. Um, we, he, he said that my dad was a warrior, and so it just leads me to one of my you know, anecdotes that I love to share about my dad. My dad is from a place called Tuscaloosa, Alabama, right? Oh. Tuscaloosa is a Choctaw native word. It means black warrior. And I'm like, my dad is from a place called black warrior. And I mean, so I mean, when you said that he is, you kept, you keep calling him both warriors, and I mean, it just made me, you know, think about that. But I mean, thank you for those words. Thank you. Okay. Roger? Yeah, thank you, all of you. Um, this is for Mr. Noble. Um, was your family able to retain the rights of the Like It Is archives? Uh, yes. Um, uh, through the uh, assistance of his attorney who passed away, Joe Fleming, uh, they uh, won a lawsuit with ABC, and he has full we, the family has full control over a 45-year collection, uh, which, has to, which has to be cataloged and digitized, and uh, it's massive. So uh, that was probably the greatest thing my father accomplished was getting control of his work. Um, Thank you did, for that. Did you get, did you get pushback from um, ABC? Oh, hell <laughs> <laughs> when? <laughs> after or? Oh, they, they, oh, yeah, it was, it was a court battle. Yeah, and then he, he, he won. It was years in court. And then he, he won the rights. And then, of course, ABC shows up at the funeral. Gil was so great. We love Gil. But during his entire career, my father caught help for the positions that he took and for our people. And to hear the brother talk about courage. Um, just want to give you the audience a sample, and I think this is important. Uh, I, I'm a graduate of Lincoln University, and we had a, a Black History Month uh, celebration, and my father was the keynote speaker to a big event. The entire school was going to show up, and uh, my father came up there, he took me out to dinner, and uh, he said, you know, Chris, I just have to tell you, uh, I got a phone call today, and they said, you know, I know where you're going, and I'm going to bl blow the place up. And my father said, I really had to really think hard about this and do a little investigation. But he said, I really didn't want to disappoint you, so I'm here. He was forced to tell me that. These are, he lived under constant threat. Now, he's a journalist. His life is being threatened constantly. When we would walk down the street, when people would say, hey, Gil, come here, can I talk to you? He would say, son, go over there. He would make me go over to the corner. He wouldn't bring me up to the individual. because. And I think it didn't matter if the person was black or white, because after he saw our own people kill Malcolm, he didn't know where the bullet was coming from. So he said, son, go over there. And he would go address the individual and then come back to me. It's important for us to understand the context of the type of things that my father and Les Payne went through on a daily basis. And my father never came home crying about being attacked. I never heard about it unless I bumped into it. And so courage is, is beyond. Another question here. Um, it's a pleasure being here, and I, um, I uh, spent my weekends with uh, First Felipe on Saturday, and uh, RVR, and Like It Is was a staple. Nothing happened on Sunday until Like It Is went off. Then if we were going to look at sports, or we were going to go out, we were going to do, it was after Like It Is was on. I have... Uh, 23-year-old and a 20-year-old, and we felt it was important that they knew who Gil Noble was. That show was so important, and with the absence of shows like that, 
it was on us to let our kids know what Like It Is was. Uh, thank God for YouTube. And, and they were able to understand that this was an important show. And it was so important that that's one of the reasons why they had to get rid of it, get it off the air. Because that man was awesome. Uh, Les Payne, I used to read his Newsday was the only reason I used to read Newsday. And I would base my arguments on what I read from Les Payne. So I felt like I was, I was ready. Somebody said something? Let me see, what did Les say about that? Okay. All right, I'm, I'm ready to take you on. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to continue. And we have to get our kids involved because, like you said, there's an absence. There's no more LIB. There's no more this. There's no more that. And, and there's not enough. I'm sure there's some less pains out there and some more Gil Nobles. But you guys have to carry on. That's some legacy you guys have. And that's a lot on your shoulders. And I, and I hope you get the support to continue. One question I have is, is it like it is on with Sandra Bookman or some show? I don't yeah, the show. Positive is live? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, another oh, oh, let's hear it now. Hear it now. Okay. Okay, we have another question in the back. Sure, sure. I'm flying under a false flag. This is not a question. I worked for ABC News for 19 and a half years. I worked for the network for 19 and a half years. And Gil was down the street. And I'm going to tell you, there are stories, one of them. Gil had a weekend show. He was doing news reporting, and he was doing Like It Is. Like It Is was near and dear to his heart, as we all know. The executive producer of the ABC World News Tonight was a gentleman by the name of Av Weston. He wanted a black network correspondent that was younger than Mal Good. Anyone in this room know who Mal Good is? Mal Good is the guy who broke the color barrier for network television and he did it at ABC Network Television News. Bob Weston came to me and he said, look, I know you know Gil. I want you to go down to WABC, sit down with him, Ask him if he would come up and speak to me personally. I don't want to write a letter. I don't want to, I want to send someone who knows him to let him know. I walked down the street and I said, Gil, Ob Weston wants to talk to you. He looked at me and he smiled. <laughs> he said, Eric, what does Ob Weston want? Why is he sending you here? And I said, he wants you to come be one of his network correspondents. He said, you know what? I know that's a higher profile. I know I can make a ton more money, but I gotta stay right where I am because what this show does for our people, can't give it up. Gil and I had an amazing relationship in that he knew what I was going through at that network, so I could always call him when I had a shoulder that I needed to cry on. Oh, yeah, by the way, my name is Eric Tate. I used to be the foreign assignment editor for ABC News back in the 70s, so I understood what Gil was doing when he was putting all that African stuff on his shows, because I'd have a hard time in those meetings trying to get these people to cover other parts of the world rather than Europe. <laughs> but, but to make a long story short, that man, if I said, Gil, Mount Vernon's having a parents' day. They need somebody who can appeal to the entire community and to the kids. Can you fit it in your schedule? He said, what's the day? What time? And it'd be one of the weekend days that he really only had one day free, and he'd still come. That's the kind of guy Gil Noble was. Well, I mean, 
By the time I left ABC News, I was producing for 2020, okay? So I'd be covering stories, and I would have all kinds of additional footage that ended up on the cutting room floor that never made it into a cut spot. My favorite of those stories was the time we went with Jesse Jackson before he made his announcement. Traveled from California all across the country, over to Europe. Only place we didn't go with him to was West Berlin. We came back, cut the piece. Guess what? Didn't show up on the 2020 show. Another story, another fight. He said, oh, look, look, we don't want to waste all this footage. I'm going to let you, no, I'm going to give it to Nightline. I said, no, you're not giving my footage to Nightline. Now, I'm telling the executive producer of 2020, you're not giving my footage. Okay, now, <laughs> this is craziness. He said, no, 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 no. I know exactly where you're coming from. You're going to walk it down the street. You're going to do the piece for them. I said, okay, fine, I'll do that. So I walked it down there. I cut the piece for him. I cut a seven and a half minute piece. Correspondent, I forget who it was, the fellow with glasses, um, went to Fox for a brief while, ended up Channel 13, senior moment. He said he'll never run this. They don't run seven minute pieces on Nightline. I said, look, cut the piece, let him screen it. He can do whatever he wants with it once we've done what we've done. He came in, this guy by the name of Bill Lord, he screened it, he says, run it. After that, Nightline didn't run two minute pieces anymore. We broke the mold. But all that footage that I had with Jesse, guess where it ended up? Like it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I can't begin to tell you what Gil Noble means to me as a veteran black journalist fighting those plantation mentalities. Uh, when I left 2020, I just said I had enough of this. I set up my own production companies. <laughs> but, but Gil was my inspiration. Thank you, brother. Right. Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What time do we have, guys? Hmm? What time? Until, we got about time for a couple, two more questions, maybe. OK. I'm going to uh, raise a, a question, because I think <laughs> well, I know, you can't. Uh, we opened the video with Gil talking about what the media was like uh, when he was a young reporter. And it dawned on me that that was the way it was when I was coming up. It was the same battles. And it pains me today that this is the same battle that young reporters are facing. So the question is, when do we stop this fight? Or is this a perpetual fight? I mean, where does this go? Milton, you wanna? Uh, I think when we live in an environment where, uh, I call this extremely radical capitalism, <laughs> ruthless capitalism, that swallows media outlets when they're profitable, and then draws all the skills. So what do you do in an environment like that? So it's a bigger story. It's not only journalism per se, but it's the economic system under which we live. And I think about that often. How is this going to change? And it seems to me there has to be some disruption in the economic system and the politics. That's my bigger take. And in fact, I had a very interesting conversation with a very wealthy individual. He's actually a billionaire. But he's, a, <laughs> but, but he's been, you know, you know how billionaires right, are. They hold their money tight. <laughs> but he said something interesting. He's in his 80s now, so I think he can speak freely. He said, Milton, something is going to happen in this country. There's going to be a social upheaval, uprising, and they're going to try to use the military to suppress it, but it's not going to work. Yes. It won't work. Yes, yes, yes. And, he, and, he, and he told me, he said, you know why I'm saying this? He said, because when I started making my money, there was a middle class. You could actually get a job. You could <laughs> you know, buy a home, send your kids to college, you could retire and have a savings. 
He says, today it's impossible. There is me and the rest of you. I mean, including me, I guess, right? And that is worrying him. And he says, I won't be here when you deal with it, but it may occur in your lifetime. So when you hear wealthy people starting to talk like that, you know, because I don't think you can change media structures independent of the, exactly, the substructure itself of the economy. Anybody else want to win? If well, Trump, Trump said clearly to us, <laughs> I want civil war. Yeah. Yeah. He said it clearly. What more do we need to understand that we're going to go through an economic recession? It's going to blow our minds. We, we don't know how badly this is going to fall. And when it falls, there's going to be, there's going to be, there's going to be people going out there saying they want to kill black people. Now, my, my position is this. Um, even don't we forget the Mexicans. Yeah, either we get hit and understand that this that you're absolutely right, that there's going to be a major social, political, and economic upheaval. At this point, Warren is, of course, beating Biden, but nobody's really looking at what Sanders is saying. Um, and when you have centrists and people who are moderates in a situation where we have the extreme on the other side, well, no, we got to move more to the middle. That's why Hillary lost. She lost because she was so mealy mouthed and so middle of the road. People need change. And the only one at this point who's talking about some real change is Sanders. I'm not, you can say what you want to say about Biden. I'm telling you, we're in a crisis, we're in a constitutional crisis. Now he's going to make more money from the G7 summit. I don't know why reporters are not hard. I mean, saying this guy is a traitor. Not only is he a thief, a liar, a rapist, but he's a traitor. Had this been Obama, what, what basically would be on the right now? Thanks, Felipe. I, I just want to give someone a chance. Another question from the audience. I was actually going to make a comment. Thank you so much for the panel tonight. It was wonderful. And speaking of courage, I thought it was, I think it's important that Jamal or Tammy tell the story of Les here putting himself in danger, particularly the migrant camp on Long Island, because I think that's really key to his personality. Um, I'll, 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 I'll take it. Um, he, uh, he was at Newsday, um, I believe, for just six months. And uh, they had this, uh, you know, he was a young, he was, he was older than a lot of the young reporters because he served in the military for six years. So he came in as a 28-year-old rookie, and the other rookies in the class, I believe, were about four or five years younger than him. And uh, so he came in, and he had a little bit of seasoning on him. But... Uh, they had a chance, they had a summer magazine at, at Newsday that they were gonna allow the junior reporters and I guess the rookies to uh, you know, have their way with it. And so he you know, took it upon himself to you know, look for stories. And so he was encouraged by, or he was in, intrigued. He had, as my sister said, he had a tremendous curiosity. And so he had heard about these migrant camps, uh, these migrant farms out on Long Island, out, way out on the east in Suffolk County. And, uh, and he heard that there were people that came up from the South and uh, they were migrant workers and, you know, and, and the treatment that was happening and the stories that were used to cover them were always from the standpoint of the owner of the farms or the, the people that worked at the farms, but never the migrants themselves. And so you know, when he would ask questions like, why don't we hear about the migrants? They would say, oh, well, you know, they don't really talk to anybody. And, and, and it's because, as I said earlier, most journalists go to the police department or they go to the owner of the property and they talk to them and then they get the story. And so my dad, you know, devised this strategy where he would disguise himself as a migrant, which, you know, he would always laugh when he told this story because he would say that if you knew him, I mean, like, no one would think that he could, you know, dusty himself up and, you know, become this you know, migrant worker, but he did. And, you know, and because he wanted the story. And so his idea was he wanted to know, like, you know, with the deaths in Salwedo, he wanted to know in this story, and this was, this happened in, I believe, 1970. He wanted to know what was going on in these camps, how these workers were, you know, what was their conditions? How did they get paid? And so he went on this camp for a week. And, uh, and he, he had fashioned this name. He called himself Bubba. And uh, he dusted himself up and he, you know, had these work clothes and he, you know, hitchhiked out to Ronkonkoma, I believe that's where it was. And, uh, oh, it was Riverhead. It was Riverhead. And so he, he, he hitchhiked out and, you know, and then got on this camp and, you know, talked his way into this job. And so he was on a camp and they were uh, making water, 
uh, on this farm, there was a potato farm, I believe, and they were doing irrigation, they were making irrigation things. And so uh, immediately, my dad, he was an army ranger captain in the military, so he understood how to lead. And so like, they were doing these irrigation, you know, uh, bu building these contraptions. And he, of course, they, you know, I mean, the migrants weren't, you know, they, they hadn't done a lot of schooling, so they weren't, you know, really, you know, uh, coordinated. And so my dad was coordinating them. And I mean, they immediately were like, wait a minute, something's wrong with this guy. <laughs> you know, he, he totally stuck out. Like he wasn't like all the other guys, even though he, you know, drank with them, he fought with them, he spoke their language and, you know, he, you know, because he's from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So, and he told them that's where he was from. And so he said that you get paid on Friday and then on Thursday, here comes one of the, you know, the guys on the, on the property and he, you know, calls Bubba in and says, hey Bubba, you know, we have this guy, you know, we're gonna ask you some questions. So my dad said, oh man, you know, I think they figured me out. But he was like, I, you know, I should leave now. But he was like, but I need to see how they get paid and, uh, you know, and, and all the things. And so, you know, it goes through this thing. And so he was just telling me, uh, and he would tell us the story. And, he, and, and, you know, and the story is that when he told them where he was from, he, he didn't lie. He, was, he told them he was from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 27, you know, 07, 22nd Street. That's where he grew up. And, uh, and so this guy happened to be from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And he said, uh, what are the radio stations in Tuscaloosa, Alabama? And so he knew, uh, 92.3 is this one. And, and, and you know, he knew the radio stations. And then they said, well, do you know where Tushin's service station is? And he said, yeah, it's on 22nd Street. And, you know, and, he, you know, and they asked him a couple of, Now, so if he said he was from you know, North Carolina, this would have been a different situation because you know, this guy who was asking the question, you know, he had a 357 revolver on him. And you know, if he answered the question wrong, this is gonna be it because I mean like, but anyway, so he goes through the whole situation and he figured out and then he actually ended up telling them about his uncle. And his uncle was this notoriously known, you know, uh, bad man in Tuscaloosa, like the baddest guy in town. And so when he told them who this guy was, his, his name was Deadwood Dick. The, the guy said, oh, that's your uncle? Oh, you know, so he totally passed this Deadwood Dick is what they call him. His name was Edward, but they called him Deadwood Dick after a cowboy. But I mean, he, was a, he, was a, he was a bad hombre. Not like, not like Trump says. That's what, that was a black guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deadwood Dick. Yeah, Deadwood Dick. And so anyway, so he, uh, he uh, you know, he um, gets through this interrogation, and he realized, like, you know, this, this is it. So he stayed on so he could figure out how these guys got paid. And then he saw what happens is during the week, they would drink whiskey and they would take uh, IOUs against their pay on the week. And then when they came time to get your pay on Friday, nothing left. Sorry, you owe. And then, you know, so you work for free, basically. And so my dad was able to tell this, to get the story. And then he gets his notes and he, you know, and so he called his friend. I believe he called Bill Knapp to come pick him up. And Bill Knapp didn't even recognize him when he drove up. Like, you know, and all his friends at Newsday were like, oh, you'll never be able to pass for Bubba. You'll never, be, you know, and he, he didn't even recognize him. And so dad got in the car and, you know, Bill, you know, Bill's kind of, he's kind of aloof anyway, but he was like, he, he definitely didn't recognize him. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, and so my dad wrote this brilliant piece about, you know, how, you know, these migrant camps are going on. And so, of course, the owners were furious. And, and of course, you know, the, 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 you know, but once again, he, he thought that it was more important that we find out how these people are, you know, and what the story is. And so as Tammy said, you know, his biggest thing was to do the work, to go out there, go out in the field and do the work and, you know, and put the time in. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm sure he had some answering to my mother about, you know what I mean, like, He's taking tremendous risk, and uh, you know what I mean. But I mean, at the same time, and my mother would always say, as I was Tam and I have asked her many times, and she said, well, "What else was I going to do? He was going to do it anyway." But more importantly, she knew how important this work was, and I mean, I think that that is the thing that both Gil and and my dad. I mean, like these guys were out there, but I mean, you know, they had families. And speaking from our position, I mean, like I guess I can say, man, you know, what, what was that about? But at the same time, now looking back. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want him to do anything else. I mean, like, I think that, you know, to stand here and to look at the legacy that those two men left, I mean, like, that's, yes, that's what you're supposed to do. And, you know, and we want to move Can forward. Can I just make sure, one go quick ahead, comment? Um, on, in, in relation to that story, uh, my father made sure that mom and I were in Connecticut <laughs> with my grandmother and uncles <laughs> safely away in case anybody found out where dad lived because <laughs> you never knew. But um, I wanted to just make a comment to, because we're talking about these uh, great men and their careers and what they give to the community. But I also want to make a comment about what they gave to each other. They were friends. They weren't just colleagues. They weren't just 
you know, we respect the work that you do. Um, my dad actually said that um, Gil Noble is one of his living heroes. And um, they actually met each other here at City College, 1972, at a gathering for uh, black journalists. And dad used to always say, oh, black journalists back then, they always used to fix their workplace to their names. So it'd be Ed Bradley, CBS Radio, and Tom, you know, Tom Johnson, New York Times. And dad was like, but Gil was not like that. He said, dad always set Gil apart from the, other, from the crowd because he said, I'm Gil Noble. And, that's it. and that was it. And, but I want to talk about a little bit about their friendship in that when we talk about courage and we talk about standing on our shoulders and our answers, but we also, it's important that we have our friends and we know how to be true friends in these fields, and especially when you're sticking your neck out. Um, they were not afraid to stand up for each other when the, when the water rose. When, um, when, like it is, was being threatened to be taken off the air and, um, or they were going to say in 1982, Gil Noble can only cover local stories. We don't want him to call it international stories because we don't like the fact that he talked about the US interest in Israel. And they didn't like that. So a lot of Jewish interest groups got angry and they protested ABC and the community also stood up. But dad took his column, his platform, and used his column. He wrote two consecutive columns, one documented for the history, the value of Gil Noble and the shell like it is to everybody. And the second, to talk about this situation and how they were trying to hobble the shell and Gil Noble in doing what he's trying to do. And he ended the column by saying, it is a felony crime to do this when people, in denying people the right the right to know this information for your special interests. I, don't, I mean, I have it here in the co you know, his column, but I just I wanted to share that. They stood up for each other. When Dad went to, Jamal talked about uh, covering Soweto Uprising in 1976, Gil Noble invited my father to speak to, uh, to appear on Like It Is. It was probably his first appearance. And I remember it clearly. And... Um, you know, and Dad talked about what he uncovered, what he saw. He shared photos from his trip. And this exposed Dad and got him out of the confines of Long Island, because he only had Long Island at that time. He was not a syndicated columnist. And, uh, and, New York, and Newsday was not New York Newsday. It was Long Island Newsday. So it got him out of the confines. And this information is now being broadcast on ABC News in New York. And people are like, who is this guy? So they helped each other along the way. And they were unafraid to help each other and others that they felt needed protection, particularly when it came to police brutality, when it came to the drug wars here, heroin, crack. I mean, your father did the seminal piece on heroin addiction in Harlem. I mean, I remember watching that, and it, I still cry about that. It is chilling. And so I will also say on a personal note that my brothers could not go outside and play until after I like it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I really wanted to talk about that. It's important. It's not just that you do the work, that you, you, you support. You have to support the colleagues for the right reasons, though, not for a personal gain. And oh, and this last anecdote about the book. Um, my father went to Detroit and he had met with, uh, through his friend, Walter Evans, um, he met Philbert Little and he interviewed him for eight hours. And, you know, and Gil Noble was a big fan of Malcolm X. They would talk about it and Gil would often ask in their meetings, you know, have you ever met Malcolm? You know, and dad would talk to him about, yeah, I saw him speak. So, um, but when he interviewed Philbert Little, he came back to New York and he was so excited. He told Gil about, hey, I met him. I talked to him for eight hours. And Gil said, well, which brother? Which brother did you talk to? And dad said, Philbert. And he said, well, Wilfred's the brother you need to talk to. <laughs> so dad went back to Detroit, got his buddy Walter Evans to introduce him to Wilfred. And another eight hours. And those 16 hours of interviews with the brothers um, opened dad's mind 
to realize that he admired Malcolm X. He would read Malcolm X, the autobiography, like every five years. I have his dog-eared copy, copy of the autobiography at home. Um, and he said, I don't really know Malcolm. I didn't know how he was formed. The brothers shared childhood stories, the early family stories. And the thing is, we're not formed you know, at 21. We're not formed at 36. It is you know, the younger years. And nobody really knew about that. And they still don't really know about it. There were, there are stories I've leaked out, and, and but. Well, you will. <laughs> coming in the book, pretty much your details. But I just wanted to share that, and thank you again for this great I, I feel, I just, yeah, I, before I we I go. Need, I don't think I need a mic. I just had a question about the archives. Um, is, is there anything uh, set up in order to make those archives public or to get we're, them online? Or? Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on that, brother. That's, that's coming. Um, but before we leave, it's important. I wanted everybody to know what made my father who he was. Uh, number one, he studied Malcolm X. Malcolm had a tremendous impact on my father. And my father modeled his life after Malcolm. His level of courage, his level of love of black people, his discipline. My father would tell me so many stories. He said, you know, you know, Malcolm would read three newspapers before everyone's alarm clock goes off in the morning. So it, he was just amazed at Malcolm's preparation and his level of pureness. So that was one thing. And then my father also saw Malcolm had an information cabinet of Adam Clayton Powell, Dr. Clark, all of these brilliant black minds. And my father always surrounded himself with brilliant black minds like that. I, I could tell you stories where my father would take me to John Clark's apartment here, uh, house in, in uh, Brownstone in Harlem, and they would spend hours chopping it up. And it was just, and, and, and John Clark's home was filled with books. I've never seen that many books in my life. It was like a public library. And so these Surrounding himself with these type of individuals and studying our heroes and, our, and, and, all, the, and all the people that have stood up for black people and, and modeling his life after them and his love of Africa um, really shaped him into who he was. I mean, he never just wanted to be a TV star. And once you have that foundation, you know, that's, that's what separates a Les Payne and a Gil Noble from just everyday journalists and everyday TV stars. It was about their consciousness, their love of being Africans, and their, their desire to tell the truth. And they, they were excellent journalists, on par with any top journalist ever mentioned throughout history. That's without question. But it was their consciousness and their love of black people and their courage to stand up and tell the truth no matter what. And so it's very important, it, 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 that always, you know, stands out in my mind when I think about my father is everything that made him who he was. What you heard on Like It Is was maybe a conversation that he had with John Clark or maybe another historian. All of that is funneled. The way we pool our information when we share with each other is so important. And so that would come out unlike it is and in different formats. And that's what it's all about, pooling our information, constantly digging for the truth, and sharing it with the family. I don't know how many months ago it was when we spoke like 9 o'clock at night. It was several months ago. I had no idea it would be so informative and so great. And I want you guys to please give them a round of applause. Yeah. And for some reason, I woke up in the middle of the night and said, well, I want to do something for Gil. And I want to do something for Les. I said, why don't we do them together? And it couldn't have worked out better. I hope you agree with me. OK? So thank you all. I know this can go on and on, but they're going to kick us out in a few minutes. So thank you for coming. And uh, we're going to make the uh, video available. Um, if you need to, I can give you my card. We'll make sure that you uh, get access to it. Thank you for coming. Have a good night.